but that we put a piece of paper around the uh, the group to ask you to all jot down how many years. I'm sorry, I'll do it because you've got How many years you'd been uh, listening to the archers? And we had something like over 3,000 years of listening in the room. So we'd like to do that again. So I'm going to come around and put some pieces of paper at the front tables. And if you can send them back, and everybody just jot down, just in years. Uh, not, don't say just all of it, but just put down the years there. And then we'll top that up uh, before the end of the day. So I'm going to hand that out. Amazing. And one other thing... Very discreetly, the Ambridge quilt has been put down at the front, and you really must see it, it's amazing, it's an amazing thing. So, our next session is on rural identities and the cultural world of Ambridge. And our first speaker is the wonderful Felicity McDonald Smith, who has supported us for many years. And this is your first paper with her? You've done, you've had for a little before. Phoebe goes to Oxford. Phoebe goes to Oxford, yes. So I will hand over a history of Ambridge and a hundred objects. Okay, can everybody hear me? Can you speak? Can you hear in the far corner? No. Right, handheld. What's funny about some... Um... If I hold it like that, can you hear? Yes. Okay, I'll do that then. The title of this talk was suggested to me by Elizabeth Campion of this parish. <laughs> Inspired by Neil McGregor's Radio 4 series and book, A History of the World in 100 Objects, describing exhibits from the British Museum and setting them in their historical and anthropological context. Apologies to anyone who was expecting a discussion of 100 objects in five minutes. <laughs> but I hope to have a quick look at the significance of material culture in the arches. The first use of the term material culture has been traced back to the splendidly named Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, <laughs> whose collection of archaeological and ethnographic objects formed the basis of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, first opened to visitors in 1887. Pitt Rivers wrote that his readers should consider material culture as the outward signs and symbols of particular ideas of the mind. If you've been to the Pitt Rivers Museum, you'll know that he collected everyday artifacts as well as fine art items, and that these are arranged by category rather than by country or historical period. Since the mid-1970s, there's been a growing interest in material culture across many disciplines, most obviously history, but also archaeology, social anthropology, history of art, human geography, design, and the decorative arts. My personal interest arose from volunteering with the David Parr House in Cambridge. This is a tiny terrace cottage which David Parr, a working-class Victorian artist decorator, bought in 1886 and lived in until his death in 1927. Over that time, he decorated the house in the style of the Victorian Gothic Revival churches and arts and crafts houses he worked on every day as an employee of the Cambridge Decorative Arts Company, F.R. Leach & Sons, who worked all over the country with well-known designers, including William Morris. After Parr's death in, eight, in 1927, his granddaughter Elsie, then aged 12, came to live in the house to keep her grandmother company and stayed there for the next 85 years. <laughs> During which time she married and had two daughters. Because of Elsie's respect for her grandfather's legacy, very few changes were made to the structure or decor of the house while she lived there, but she accumulated a collection of her own artefacts, and over the course of 2018, a team of volunteers, including me, 
examined and catalogued these, along with objects from David Parr's time. For me, the charm of the house lies in the layers of history of the rooms and their inhabitants, illustrated by the variety of functional and emotional significance of all these objects. Here are just three of my favourites, coming up, not these ones, from different periods in the life of the house. A set of dominoes, possibly made by David Parr himself, and therefore late 19th or early 20th century. A time without TV or the internet, people had to entertain themselves with cards, books and other games. A book in the school story genre, presented to Elsie as a Sunday school prize in 1929. Clearly a treasured item, it not only still has its original dust jacket, but has been given additional protection with a brown paper cover, an inside-out paper bag from Eden Lilly, once a well-known Cambridge department store no longer in existence, showing pictures of ladies in the fashions of the time. And the last one, a wooden school ruler belonging to one of Elsie's daughters, dated to the 1960s, partly because I know she's about my own age, and partly because of Cliff, written multiple <laughs> times <laughs> in Biro on the flat side of the ruler. And so to Ambridge. What items will future historians or archaeologists pore over, analysing the way of life and family relationships of this village community? Here are some suggestions. I'm sure you can add many others. I've already heard some, and I look hearing, forward to hearing more later. The power of objects to bring back memories has been illustrated recently in the story of the Aldridge's departure from home farm. Debbie retrieving her old jewellery box with the ballerina that doesn't stand up anymore and what could that possibly symbolise? <laughs> Jennifer and Peggy reminiscing about evenings spent with all the family gathered on the old sofa in the farmhouse kitchen. Similarly, when Lily and Rex were decorating the Christmas tree at Lower Loxley, Lily's memories of past Christmases were stirred by the homemade tree ornaments. I suggest this one might have been done by Freddie. <laughs> what will historians make of a shoebox in the bottom of a wardrobe at Brookfield containing model farm animals with David Archer, my farm in childish handwriting on the lid? Will they know that David's discovery of this collection years later and the emotions it aroused were responsible for his decision not to move to Northumberland, thereby averting a crisis in the Ambridge social network? <laughs> in the grounds of Ambridge Hall, archaeologists might uncover a large stone bearing the inscription, Resurgam. <laughs> With Ed. <laughs> no, not that Ed. <laughs> the experts may speculate that it could be a monument commemorating the successful revival of the Canterbury Tales, performed under the direction of Mrs. Linda Snell in December 2018, but we know better. And finally, let's hope that future archaeological or historical investigations will solve an ongoing mystery when a grubby collection of rags attached to a length of string <laughs> is identified as a 20th or 21st century decorative artefact known as bunting. This will be found stuffed behind a chest of drawers in a house formerly owned by a family who've requested anonymity. <laughs> I suggest you ask the people wearing the I Stole the Bunting t-shirts. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker needs no, no introduction. I think we should do 100 objects. I think we should create a list. Yeah. We do Ambridge in 100 objects. We almost got there with the recipe that I did, not we? We did, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's, right. we'll, we'll sort that out. Hashtag Ambridge in 100 objects. 
Our next speaker needs no introduction. I need more time <laughs> to have done this paper properly. <laughs> End of year at Tate does not wait for querying Lower Loxley. Um, this is, we do quick pitches at this uh, conference, which is for people just to sort of throw some ideas out, some ponderings, and this, this, prod, this, this presentation is very much a pondering. It's not, say, a research project or a particular statement. But I'm interested in what stories might lie behind the history of Lower Loxley and the part of the family that may show a different side uh, to rural life than the sort of heteronormative portrayal that we're so used to. Rural life in general and bridge in particular. So I was lucky enough to visit Lower Loxley uh, last year, and aside from the awful conditions of the grounds that you can see here, I was able to wander the house, not the roof, that was boarded up, but I was able to wander around particularly unattended. I'd been led to believe that there were some volunteer-led tours that I could go on, but from that particular email address, um, I got a message to say that the group was considering industrial action, so we're taking a bit of a respite for the moment. Now, the post-1950 uh, uh, Partita family, Ambridge Partita family, has been somewhat chronicled over recent years, as we know, but through the house I saw signs or glimpses of what the Partita ancestors and extended family that we know little of. Now, I bet this woman has some stories to tell, and I quite took a fancy to her. I would like to go out to a ball with that lady. But as a quick aside, have a look at some of the plaster work through this as well. Pargeting was a form of house decorating, similar to modern plastering, originally practised in the East Anglian region and going nationwide, but it was particularly popular in the West Midlands. Coming to the last century, here we have Nigel's more immediate ancestors as children. And then these two, a great uncle perhaps, and his lifelong companion. <laughs> <laughs> I did try this door. There was weeping behind it, so I quickly went on my way. I left well alone. But whilst I was there, I was able to do some digging around, and despite not having a guide on hand, I was able to find the family's coat of arms. This is the Partita coat of arms. And find out that it's a medieval surname recorded around the time of Henry VIII. One ancestor was a William, who was a Lord Mayor of London in 1530. Others were recorded as being from West Bromwich and Staffordshire. But that was about it. But then comparing Ambridge to the rest of the UK, we do know that many of our stately homes uh, were home to and shaped by people who above and below stairs challenged conventional ideas of gender and sexuality. Now one of the things that started me thinking about this, uh, this idea was um, a, a project, uh, was a sort of campaign and programme by the National Trust. So in 2017, to mark the 50 years of the partial decriminalisation of homosexuality, the National Trust explored its LGBTQ uh, heritage with a campaign and a programme called Prejudice and Pride, giving prominence to these hidden, previously hidden narratives of its properties. So visitors up and down the country were able to discover hidden histories of love and relationships and its properties, exploring some of the stories of persecution and the expressions of personal identity that shocked and challenged societal norms at the time. The National Trust worked with artists to create new exhibitions and installations to really bring these stories to life um, and uncovered previously untold stories with help from academic experts. Um, and participated in community celebrations, pride, heritage, open days and the like to really build an understanding of these LGBTQ uh, histories in local communities. Now, if you want to know more, uh, Pride and Prejudice uh, was a, is presented as a podcast uh, presented by our wonderful uh, Claire Balding, but also co-hosted with a dear friend of mine, EJ Scott, who is a dress... Uh, historian and also the curator of the Museum of Transology. It's a fascinating series of six quite short little um, podcasts and that and, and talking to, to people from all sides of the National Trust up and down the country. I can't recommend it enough. But back to Lower Loxley. We've had Lily temporarily assume a lesbian identity to hide her relationship with Russ. Part of the collective reaction to this storyline was to point out the lack of gay, lesbian or queer characters um, in the Archers. 
And a lot of that reaction actually then took an opportunity, so it's was saying there's an opportunity being missed here to represent a rural queer experience that Lower Loxley would have been part of and certainly could be part of. As one tweeter commented, uh, given the circumstances under which Julia became Mrs. Partita, I imagine that any number of London gay thespians would have visited. But the stately home, Lower Loxley's stately home to date, has been more of a secretive friend of, Meredith, of Meredith than an out and proud friend of Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> We've had uh, papers in the conference and conversations online that are around queer and bridgeology. That is a proper word. Um, the paper is a small part of that discipline, provoking the question through a consideration of Lower Loxley, where is the queer in Ambridge? The National Trust's Pride and Prejudice was a national storytelling moment of those previously hidden or just alluded to histories. And the Archers is nothing if not storytelling like the National Trust, is now the time for it to liberate its LGBTQ stories from their place in the closet. Thank you. I am happy to take questions on how boring Adam and Ian are. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody wants to join me to bring back Charlie Thomas, I will happily with good people. Yes! <laughs> I mean, that could be one of the, you know, an art, uh, public art uh, commission that, that they had as part of that history telling. I don't know. <laughs> if there's no other questions, I think we should move swiftly on. Okay. <gasps> Here's a treat. <laughs> yes, I've been looking forward to this one. Felicity, are you around? Marvellous. Hello? Nope. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, it's Rude Mechanicals. Oh, no, no, it's no, 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 it's you. No, no, no. But um, Hamish, Hamish Fife, who, there is the Rude Mechanicals paper there. Hamish Fife couldn't be with us today. Um, very, anyway. We'll put it online. We'll put it online. Yeah, yeah. I've been looking forward to that one for... He put that in straight after the last conference, so we've been sitting on it for, like, 18 months. <laughs> So, 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 do you want to catch your breath? Are you okay? Are you ready? No, it's fine. So, um, in the blue book, Gossip, I write about um, voluntary action, and it couldn't fit better with this paper about uh, the things that you're neither obliged to do because of kinship or because of contractual relationships. Who is doing the church flowers these days? Right, can you hear me? Um, I'm talking about flower arranging in St Stephen's Church, Ambridge. I'm not talking about professional florists. There? There? Is that all right? I'm not talking about professional florists who come in to do wedding flowers. Um, I'm talking about, as Nicola has said, the people that do the flowers on a regular basis. This is a bit of a historic overview. I'm not talking about contemporary characters. I've gone back into the archives and looked at the history books. This is a poem from Philip Larkin. I step inside the church door. I step, I step inside, letting the door thud shut. Another church, matting seats, stone and little books, sprawling of flowers cut for Sunday, brownish now, some brass and stuff. He's describing a familiar scene. It's all like all the other churches. It has arrangements of flowers that sprawl. They're untidy. And other than the brownishness, there are no other colours mentioned. It might be familiar to Larkin, but one wonders who put those flowers there. Why? Why are they arranged like that? And are they coming back to get rid of the dead ones? Cutting and growing flowers have been used across different societies and points in history as commodities, ritual objects and symbols, as identified particularly by Jack Goody, the anthropologist, in his book Culture of Flowers. And human interaction with them has often been described in gendered terms. In Europe, 
Flowers were used in pre-Christian worship, and there were references to garlands, wreaths, and cut flowers being used in Christian services in medieval churches. However, the practice of using cut flowers and floral imagery in churches became increasingly contentious following the Reformation and its rejection of Catholic medieval practices. The 19th century was a particularly confused period in attitudes to the use of cut flowers. Some Protestants regarded the flower as a reproductive organ and therefore as inappropriate to have in a place of worship. Others regarded flowers as tools of Catholicism designed to ensnare women into popish ways. In 1853, the church warden of St Paul's in Knightsbridge complained to the Bishop of London that his vicar was encouraging bouquets of flowers in the church, and he described them as foreign fripperies. The bishop ruled on the practice and said it could continue, but flowers should not be arranged in cross shapes, and they should only be in bunches of one colour. A further ruling in 1858 of a Anglican Handbook of Ritual stated, unnatural twisting of flowers into festoons is to be avoided. Arrangements were to be restrained, formal and symmetrical. And flowers were to, quote, present a manly and disciplined use. <laughs> the fecund femininity of the female flower can and will be constrained by the masculinity of design. The natural world can be allowed into the church, but only subject to very specific designs. These, these, this is an illustration from Edward Cutts' 1854 essay on decoration in churches. There's no sprawling, no frippery, just straight lines. And Cutts, in particular, who wrote at length about this, floral decorations or foliage decorations had to echo the architecture of the churches. Although, um, as you can see in this piece, well, you might not be able to, the text at the bottom says, these two drawings show how temporary ecclesiastical decorations make a perfect background for the fashionable feminine costumes of the period. And you might be able to see a woman, bottom right, in a bustle, blending in. Implicit in Cutts' writing is that women are the ones going to be doing the flowers, but their husbands and brothers are going to be the ones fixing them up. Fit the, um, you can see that these are um, arrangements of leaves that have been fixed to staves and fixed to the walls. We now jump to the middle and late 20th century and the Church of St Stephen's, which was established in 1281 in Ambridge. It's actually listed on the Church of England heritage record, 647001, if anyone's interested. It's a fairly typical English rural church and has few special characteristics. And I would say it's probably very much the type of church that Larkin was writing about. So who's doing the flowers? Apparently, in 2008, a number of old flower rotor lists were found at the back of a cupboard in the vestry, and I think they were found by someone called Joanna Toy. They list the pairs of parishioners who were to do the flowers for each of the four Sundays for the following months. So we've got June 1955, August 1963, September 75, May 85, January 1996, September 2008. What they don't tell us is how the rotors might have changed or whether the same people did the same Sundays throughout the year. And we don't know who drew the rotor up, were they self-selected, did people choose to work with the people they were working with. I haven't been able to find any data about the Flower Festival, which took, part in, took place in 1981 to mark 700 year anniversary of the church. So if anyone has any information on that, I'd be very grateful to receive it. Um, I've tried to kind of categorise these. Um, if they appear more than once, they're in colour and there's a kind of very rough familial relationship in colour. There are 29 individuals named over the period. 
Some appear over time, a number of times, but with different surnames. Only one woman is unmarried. Four were widows when they came to the village. Polly Perkins, Marjorie Antipas, Agatha Turvey and Laura Archer. But Peggy, Shula and Carol all become widows over the period. Both Shula and Carol remarry. And Carol actually appears with three different names. Carol Gray, Carol Grenville and Carol Tregoran. And the remainder are all married women. Of the 29 women, 19 are either related to or married to landowners or business owners, own their own business, or, as with Usha, are professionals, so we would call them middle class. Nine are working class, and one, Agatha Turvey, Agatha Turvey is indeterminate. The oldest is Doris Archer at 85 in 1975, and the youngest is Grace Archer at 25, June 1955, which, of course, was only a few short months before she died tragically in a fire. Jennifer Travers Macy, nay Archer, first appears aged 30, and Susan Carter appears in 1996, aged 33. They're both quite young for, at this point, particularly compared to the other women. And some families have generation, multi-generational engagement with the rotor. You have Polly Perkins in 1955, then by 63 her daughter Peggy's on the rotor, and then by 1975 Polly's granddaughter Jennifer is on the rotor. Lillian does not appear. <laughs> Ever. So Peggy and Jennifer continue to appear on every rotor except for January 1996. And of course this was the point at which Peggy uh, resigned from the flower rotor because of the female vicar. Jill Archer is the longest serving flower ranger and she arrives in August 63 at the age of 33 having married Phil Archer and with two small children. In January 1996 her, her daughter Shula Hebden is present. At this point she is a widow, mother of a small child and it's shortly before she has an affair with Dr. Locke. Sorry, slut shaming again. Um, so from this, we can extrapolate the following. Only women do flower arranging in Ambridge. It's a primarily middle class undertaking. It's an activity that can be shared through the matrilineal line, but not always. I mean, another person who doesn't notably um, show up in this is Elizabeth. You could argue that joining the rota offers women some sort of societal acceptance and that it is in fact a normative, if not heteronormative, type of activity. Jennifer and Susan both join at very specific points in their lives. When Jennifer arrives, appears in 75, she is in the process of splitting up with her husband, Roger Travis, Travis Macy, before marrying Brian Aldridge the following year. She then does the flowers in 2008, which, as you will all remember, is just one year after the appearance of Rory Donovan. I would say that Jennifer has had an interesting life, but her place on the road to validate her within, within Ambridge. Susan Carter is only three years out of prison when she appears on the rota for helping her brother Clive Horobin. She's the first Horobin to arrive on the list. So given what we know about Susan's aspirations and doing the flowers may represent a step up in Ambridge society. However, this may not be borne out by the fact that her rota partner, unfortunately, is Betty Tucker, who of course was held hostage by Clive Horobin. <laughs> Did doing the flowers provide a space for Betty to forgive Susan? Usha Franks, who is Hindu rather than Christian, joins the rota in September 2008, having married the vicar that summer. Given the hostile response from some parishioners such as Shula towards the marriage, she needs to join the rota to establish herself both as the vicar's wife and as a functioning, if non-Christian, member of the church community. So you can join the rota once you're married, or if you've been widowed. Single women do not join the rota. There are no single women with the exception of Carol Gray in 1955, but as one of the more unconventional people within the village, 
You could say that she is an outlier, and she uses the flower rota as a way of stabilising herself within the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, here we see, allegedly, Peggy, Carol, and Nora arranging some chrysanthemums. And it is possible that these are chrysanthemums that were grown by Carol because she was a market gardener. And there is a, um, an area of research that could go into women who do flower arranging having access to gardens where they can grow the flowers that they bring to the church, or women who are reliant on using wildflowers, or women that have to buy cheap flowers from supermarkets. It's quite a cost-heavy activity. And here we have the pulpit at St Stephen's, and what appear to be daffodils, apple blossom, and some shrubbery. And so the, these are things that are fairly easy to come by in the Borsuch countryside. <coughs> Five years before Doris and Grace did the flowers in 1955, the book Fun with Flowers by Julia Clements was published. In the Telegraph obituary of her death in 2010, she was described as having been responsible for introducing two million women worldwide to the art of flower arranging. A prolific writer, she was described as the head of a vast salvation army in which souls are saved through the medium of flowers. Her work was based on the belief that after the Second World War had deprived women of any outlet for creativity, and she toured the country giving flower arranging demonstrations. <clears throat> and she gave a lot of practical advice and training information, did a lot of writing about setting up flower clubs. And in fact, as a result of her work, in 1959, the National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies was formed. And this slide shows the flower arranger, which is the <coughs> quarterly magazine produced by NAFAS. These publications provide practical information, particularly for church flower arrangers. And this is a, an image from the NAFAS Guide to Church Flowers, published in 1967. Bit of material culture there for you. Um, and these are the different types of vases that a church flower arranging group would expect to have. They had information on the mechanics, how to put together quite complicated things, quite similar to some of the stuff that was being advocated for by Cutts in the 19th century. And here we have the archetypal, what we think of as a church flower arrangement. Um, interesting point, apparently Constance Spry invented the pedestal that was used in this way before it had been big vases rather than pedestals. So at this point, it's clear that the notion of flowers as fripperies is no longer relevant. Lots of flowers, lots of different types of colours, massed together in complete defiance of the Bishop of London's ruling. So by the time that Doris and Grace are arranging flowers in 55, the impetus for doing so is presented as springing from female creativity and artistic impulse. However, that creativity is as regulated as it previously has been. When we look at the pedestal arrangement, we see the form, a triangular shape which conforms exactly with Clement's design principles. It's a very typical nafas arrangement, and you can walk into any church in this country and you will find something that is that shape. By producing standard training manuals and running flower arranging competition, Nafas encouraged conformity of shape and use of flowers. Training materials described arrangements in detail, giving the numbers, quantities and placements of flowers to be used as though they were cake recipes. Now, given the apparent lack of new and young flower arrangers on the rota, it's reasonable to assume that the arrangements in St Stephen's haven't changed very much. I would therefore argue that flower arranging in St Stephen's does not offer real opportunities for creativity for the women of Ambridge. It offers commun communal acceptance and stability. And I just want to finish with this, which was actually produced by um, professional florists at a workshop, but I'd like to think they're phalanded flowers. <laughs> They'd look like this. Thank you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>
absolutely love that. Particularly the intersection between kind of social class and the aesthetic. I think it's really mm-hmm. inter- and gender. Yeah. Amazing. And I don't know, Abby, you have to say something because you see a lot of well, I was just going to say, um, so I'm the person who's presenting um, tomorrow about um, funerals. I'm a funeral director. Oh, and I go into churches an awful lot. And I can assure you that you always see things like that and you never see them like <laughs> So that is absolutely correct. <laughs> So, uh, any questions? I, uh, poor old Grace Archer. So there she is on the rotor at 25 with her mother-in-law. No wonder she burnt herself to death. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yep. Well, Polly appears once on the rotor as well, shortly after getting married. Nice. So. Hello. Let's have a question and a couple of comments. Um, we are currently in the process of arranging a power festival in our church, in which all the individual groups in the church are choosing an event post World War II and doing the arrangements themselves. Our flower arrangers, sadly, all widowed or married ladies still, <laughs> are deeply threatened. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I have to thank you as well, because we in Bellringers are have an inordinately large number of Archers fans. Yay. Yay. We're thinking of doing the Archers for our display from the Bellringers, and you've just been using the <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have worked occasionally as a wedding florist, and the first thing I learned, and it was quite a hard lesson to learn, was you always check out the flower ladies, because if they don't like what you're doing, because you're, you're on their territory, you know, you're using their overused um, floral foam. So you really have to be quite careful. The first, the first wedding I ever did, which was for a friend, it, was, it wasn't a professional job, we used um, big allium globes. We had them sort of lining the altar, and it was a little church in a village in Cambridgeshire. And one of the church ladies came up to me and she went, hmm, it's very modern, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're fearsome. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> if anyone was struggling with the definition of heteronormative, it's something to do with this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to about being told you were modern. <laughs> when I grew up in Sporgally, um, we had a children's club and each of the parents took in turns to teach you something interesting. We had a flower arranging with one of the ladies in the flower arranging at the church. And I did something which I thought would look good. And she pulled it out completely. <laughs> that is not how you do it. That's not how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. And then, more recently, the last... 10, 20 years, what I was doing then is what is now pretty fashionable. I'm like, where is Mrs. Marx? I've just been added to the flower up to the flower, which is so cute, it actually uses the model for the whole new railway shirt. I'm terrified. <laughs> I've only only it once this year. I think I'm just going to let you have one go. <laughs> How are we getting on with the bits of paper with the number of years listened? Are, if, if they can, I've got one. Amazing. The others can make that. their way to the front. That would be lovely. Yes. Oh, I quite want to leave these flowers up here. Aren't they gorgeous? <laughs> so, another second timer. Are you a second timer? Yep. We're looking, really looking forward to this one. Really looking forward to this one. So we're about to hear Ambridge, All the Worlds, a stage. Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> Is it about there? About here? Is yeah. this working for everybody? Okay. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Um, 
thank you for arranging. Last time I was here, I was presenting with a friend of mine who can't be here today, um, but she was a dermatologist. So, so we were talking about skin, the incidence of skin cancer in um, Ambridge. Today I'm, I'm moving back onto my own sort of territory and looking a little bit at Shakespeare and Ambridge and seeing what we think about that. So. Um, somewhere around the turn of the 16th, 17th century, a playwright by the name of William Shakespeare wrote a play, As You Like It. It's one of his pastoral plays. Some might say that it's an everyday tale of country folk, depending on whether or not your idea of what everyday is includes dukes and jesters and runaway lovers. Now, um, one of the more, more memorable speeches in that play comes is by the um, melancholic character Jaquiz. He starts off by suggesting that all the world's a stage and it's populated by men and women. So well, well done Jaquiz, you've got men and women in there. We started off rather well. And it started me thinking, how might William Shakespeare chronicle the goings on um, if he were tasked with doing a contemporary drama in a rural setting? How would he reflect upon the village of Ambridge and its inhabitants? And how do they tie in with the seven ages of man that Jacquees sets out? So, of course, the first problem is, after his good start, he only goes on to look at male roles. Well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to be accused of making Ambridge a sexist place. <laughs> I understand that can be problematic. So I have considered both men and women for each and such. Um, I have missed out hundreds of characters, both of Shakespeare's and, and of um, Ambridge, so you, you'll just have to forgive me for if I've missed out any of your particular favourites. So, the first part, then, is played by a mewling infant. Now, the newest inhabitant of Ambridge is, of course, Rosie Ruth Grace Archer, or Rosie Grace, Rosie Ruth Archer Fairbrother, Grace, or... Rosie Ruth Grace Fairbrother Archer. I don't think we know yet which it's to be, do we? And heaven only knows what Jill is going to make of the insertion of the third name on Sunday. Anyway. <laughs> also, this infant is, is in its nurse's arms. Now, when Shakespeare would have been writing this, he would have probably been thinking of a wet nurse. Now, if only Pip had been able to get a wet nurse, I'm sure she would have handed that baby over as fast as she could. <laughs> but she can't. So, now we know that Shakespeare himself knows something about the idea of conception outside of children, outside of marriage. So, the idea of Pip, um, Pip and... Um, oh, what's his name? Toby. Um, <laughs> conceiving a child is probably not something that, that, that would have fazed him at all. Um, he's sort of open-minded like that. Um, in The Winter's Tale, for example, he, he, Leontes speculates that his son Maximilius might have been fathered by somebody else, so that we know that Shakespeare has the whole idea of who fathers a child, you know, can sometimes be problematic. So, where does that take us? Now, there are a few things that probably William Shakespeare might not have thought about. He might not have thought about the arrival of Henry via a sperm donor, but I don't think he would have ever thought about the arrangement between Broody E and Adam and Lexi. I don't think that's something that would have occurred to Shakespeare at all. But he, he does um, bring surrogate parents in, into some of his stories. Again, in The Winter's Tale, um, Perdita is basically brought up, up by surrogate parents. Now, as the children grow up, as the infant grows up, they need to go to school. And we speculate that Shakespeare went to school, went to the grammar school in Stratford. Well, we know that younger children in Ambridge go to Lower Luxley. Older children um, have, to have a choice between Borsetshire Green or the private cathedral school or further afield if you're a young Rory. And then, of course, there's Borsetshire College for sixth form. Um, I'm told that they're looking for a new deputy head. <laughs> But there does, seem, there does overall seem to be some reluctance to go to school in Ambridge. Young George, we know, would much prefer to spend the day learning traditional skills with, with Eddie. Um, young Johnny, he seems to have been um, a good student when he was in Manchester, but the minute he moved to Ambridge, something seems to have happened to his schooling. He wasn't such a fan of school and, and starts to say that he was never very good at school. But 
Some people do manage to make it through schooling in Borsetshire and go off to university, but with varied, varied results. Phoebe and Alice seem to have made probably the best of their university education. I'm not sure that we could say the same about Kate. Um, and Lily seems to be at some disconnect with university at the moment, so we're not quite sure how he's going to go. Now, the next stage that we might get is the lover. You might recognise this character here. <laughs> Jazza does seem to see himself as a bit of a lover. He does have a roving eye for the opposite sex. Um, and we know that he can sing a ballad to somebody if, if need be. But I suspect his true love is, is for his piggy girls. <laughs> and they might be putting off some of the others. I mean, there, there's... There was some hope with Hannah for him, but that seems to have died away. And then we have Ambridge's newest couple, Tom and Natasha. Ooh. Now, there's some uncovered depths of Shakespeare to think about there. There's some unsuspected secrets that Tom is only just finding out about. So I think this might be a case of married in haste, repent in leisure. We will have to find out. And I'm sure Shakespeare would have had something to say about that. And one of the other things he, doesn't, he does talk about are older couples. Couples like maybe Linian and Justin. Although I desperately, desperately list, miss Pussycat and, and Tiger. <laughs> desperately miss them. Now, so we know that Shakespeare... Whoops. We know that Shakespeare has written about more mature relationships. He wrote about Cleopatra. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. And I'm sure we could apply that to Lillian. <laughs> she certainly had a bit of a variety in her love life. So, and also there, there's that awful thing. I can definitely, definitely imagine Lillian bathing in ass's milk, but I really want her to stay away from snakes. So, <laughs> now, the next stage that we look at is the soldier. Now, Shakespeare obviously has no, no worries writing parts for soldiers or warriors. We've got regal heroes like Henry V with his armies attacking France. We've got soldiers coming back from battle in Much Ado About Nothing, where, where they're looking for some rest and recuperation with the ladies. Um, so he'd have no problems at all telling us about, about the stories that coming back from Second Lieutenant Dan Hebden Lloyd. That's Dan, not Daniel. Um, Dan does seem to be missing in action at the moment, so we're not sure what, what his, the, he, what's happened to him. But I think there are some warriors that Shakespeare might not have thought about. He might not have come across the local Ambridge eco-warrior, Kirsty Miller, or Patrick, or Tom in his younger days, when, when, when he seemed to have some sort of social conscience. Um, yeah, so... so we, we have, I'm not really sure if that's Kirsty, but I think it is. So, certainly the soldier character is something, if Shakespeare were, were to, to chronicle the tales of Ambridge, and I say chron chronicle, not write, because there's a difference there. So, what about the next stage of life? We have the justice, a fair and belly with good cape on line. I see Neil Carter here. I always think of him as one of, um, well, he, he's you know, pretty full up on chilli, isn't he? So his tummy might well be getting portly. Um, I always think of him as one of the Archer's nicest and fairest characters. He has an unending supply of uh, necessary patience with Susan. Um, he's down to earth, he's principled, and he's certainly full of wise sores. So it's really no surprise that, that he was perhaps voted chair of the parish council. His kindly wisdom really perhaps ought to be listened to more. And another person that we have is quick to, who's rather quick to judge is um, Jim Lloyd, the retired professor of classics. He's certainly been giving out judgment this week with, with his words to Shula. So... Um, but Jim, I think, also has a kindly side to him. And he's the one who took in Jazza when Jazza was homeless. He's, he's the one... Um, his relationship with Alistair seems to have improved greatly since Alistair's left um, Shula, and certainly since they, they conjured up the idea of a birthday party for, 
for Alistair. Now, I did have another slide here, and I forgot to put it on before I sent them. I had a lovely, lovely picture of Linda, who I, I think also can maybe fulfill this justice role. Um, because one of the things that strikes me about Linda is she also demonstrates a deep seam of, of underlying kindness. And, and perhaps if the, the justice role is able to um, be just and give out wisdom, perhaps Linda does fall into that, although she is really annoying sometimes. But you remember the scenes with her and Kate a few years back? She, she does seem to, to um, tie into that. So what happens now? Well, we're moving rather quickly on. The pantaloon. Peggy. Peggy Woolley. I think Jake Quiz is wrong here. I don't think anybody would get away with calling Peggy Woolley a slippered pantaloon. I don't think letting, letting oneself go is, is something that Peggy would adhere to. Certainly not with her regular trips to Seaford Bruce to get her hair done. But, on the other hand, Joe. <laughs> Joe, poor Joe. He seems to be very close to Shakespeare's description of the seventh age. You can sometimes hear his voice catch when he talks about his poor Susan, or more latterly when he talks about poor Nick. He definitely seems to be shrinking physically and in character, especially now that he's having to come to terms with leaving Grange Farm. And I'm sure Clary will testify that he's already sans teeth. But what about the rest? I think he's heading towards Sons Everything. Aww. Aww. So, to sum up very briefly, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> I think if William Shakespeare were to chronicle the goings on in Ambridge, there would be certainly nothing to phase him here. And he might make a good job of providing a temporary drama in a rural setting. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> Thoughts, comments? Hello. <laughs> yes, this is question. Come back. Come back. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Final set, um, stage, the second child to Miss and Mira Vivian. We don't actually see anybody in Africa because they all disappear mysteriously into the laurels. Yeah, they do disappear into the laurels, but don't forget that, that Jack entered his second childhood, didn't he, with that really long storyline that, that was so well done. Oh, yes. But again, he was, he was in a care home and mm, was yeah. away, from the, away from his community. I think really interesting that nobody looks after older parents with dementia at home. No, but, but Clary's doing a pretty good job of caring for him. I mean, she even does his toenails. Oof. Yeah. Well, better, better a care home than a car park. Yes. <laughs> I think of Heather Pet. Um, <laughs> should we move on? Oh, no, no, another question. Come back. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh la la, Ooh, la, second la. adolescence. Actually, yeah. well, or her lover stage. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Controversial. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. <laughs> Leonard with, with Tom Riddlesworth's dad. <laughs> right, let's move on. Yeah, click the slide. So we've got next. So we were doing the, the, the photos downstairs, and I was like, Rob, you wrote in this book? And he was like, no, no. And I was like, Rob, you wrote in this book? No, no. And I was like, how can he be the crowd favourite that never have delivered the actual chapter? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> academic archers, <laughs> resident linguist, Rob Drummond. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it on the phone. Right. Oh, right. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, so um, uh, this time, as, uh, as I think I'm the only uh, linguist, there was another linguist here last time, and I think I'm the only one, so I, I decided I needed to just deal with a few general linguistic housekeeping um, issues that come up uh, from time to time. And these are the three I've chosen. Uh, that, that, these are things, 
I kind of I keep an eye on social media and see what, what people are talking about from a language perspective. And Ruth comes up a lot. Now, Ruth, I'm, 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 in, I'm defending Ruth here. Ruth's accent is, is the issue here. And people have a problem with Ruth's accent sometimes. I have to say, from a language point of view, it's actually it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's consistent. I think the actress who plays Ruth is from a, a place not far from where Ruth is from. And the thing is, in that part of the world, in that part of the country, there's loads of variation, there's loads of different accents. So I think it's perfectly acceptable for somebody to get across and say, well, I'm from near there and I don't speak like that. That's perfectly possible, to be fair. That, that's, that's all right. So I think she's OK. I think what's happening with Ruth is that we're, uh, be, we, we do this a lot uh, in, in general life, is that we project other things. We use her accent as a bit of a proxy for other things. We might not like Ruth. She can be a bit of an annoying character, and we use the accent thing to kind of get to that. So I think that might be what's going on with Ruth. Indistinguishable young men. This is this, this, yeah, you see, on this ongoing issue that there are certain characters that sound the same. So we're thinking like, I don't know, Toby, Rex, Tom, Dan, when he's back. There's, there's a certain similarity. I think it must be very hard, to be fair, for the artist to, to have distinct voices. Um, but I, with that particular situation, I think what's happening is it's all to do with familiarity. And if you were to ask a younger male listener, unfortunately... <laughs> that's not always possible. But I think if you were to ask a younger male listener, they might not have a problem. They might not find that an issue. They might have an issue with Elizabeth, Shula, Pat, them all sounding the same. So I really think it's the kind of voices you're familiar with we tend to be able to distinguish more, more clearly. So I think that's, that's what's going on there. Now, this one is actually a little bit more serious. And I got into a bit of a discussion on, on, the, on the Facebook group uh, about this. Um, but I think it's important. And what it is, is this, this creaky voice is this voice characteristic of characters like Lily and Pip, and it's this kind of croakiness, creakiness at the end of sentences. Now, this is a phenomenon among all you know, spoken language, sp spoken English in particular, that young women in particular are being picked up for the way they speak in this kind of creaky voice. The fact is, everybody has creaky voice to an extent. It's actually a real characteristic of upper class British men. When I, I give lectures about creaky voice, I always use the example of on the one hand, you've got people like Kim Kardashian, Britney Spears, now I'm going to start actually using Lily from the Archers and Pip from the Archers. They have creaky voice, but so does Jacob Rees-Mock. So does Bradley Cooper, the actor. Funnily enough, everybody does it, but the only people that get picked up are young women. And it's just another way to criticise young women. It's no different from magazines saying, young women, the way you dress is bad, or body shaming, all of those things. It's just another way of doing it. So, and it's not damaging. People say it's damaging for the voice. It, it categorically isn't, because there are some languages which actually have cre creakiness as a linguistic feature. It, it's part of the, it's part of the, the, the language. It differentiates certain words. So anyway, so that's the kind of issue that we've got to be careful when we start criticising people's voices because it's always about more than the voice. It's always about more than the accent. It's what's behind the accent. Anyway, so that's de those dealt with. <laughs> On to the grandis. Right. What this, what this isn't, so I'm talking about the, the male, uh, ma uh, family linguistic family case study of the male grandis. What this isn't is, isn't about... Uh, Judging, uh, judging the actor's abilities uh, and uh, inconsistencies. Obviously, it's not judging it against a genuine Borsetshire accent for fairly obvious reasons. We don't, we don't explicitly say this in this room. But there, are, there, are, there are reasons why we can't categorically say this is a Borsetshire accent. So I'm not about that. I'm kind of more about the idea that this is what's being presented to us as the complete picture, so we can, we can talk about it in the way that everybody's been talking about things today. So, uh, we need to do a bit of linguistics, though, a bit of phonetics. Now, um, in terms of what, what accents actually are, accents uh, are, are really just variation in the sounds of language. We talk about dialect. Accent and dialect are two different things. Uh, accent is actually uh, part of dialect, but it's specifically the sounds. Dialect is about uh, grammar and, and words as well, but accent is specifically the sounds of language. And it's how they vary. Most accent is carried, accent differentiation is, ca is carried in the vowel sound. It's only the vowel sounds that vary, really. Some consonant sounds, but mostly vowel sounds. And it's only very small differences. There are only, it's only a very limited set of sounds which carry, which carry accents. We think of accents being very different, but it's only actually a small set of, uh, subset of sounds. And we need to do a bit of phonetics. So, 
What this is, this is a, this, now if you were here, I think the, the very first one, I think McCoy, someone I know, Will Barris, did a really nice talk about um, accents and he might have showed you this diagram. And what this is, this is an abstract representation of, of the oral cavity. It, vowels, we can differentiate vowel sounds depending on where they're produced in the mouth. This is like an abstract realization of, imagine a face in profile facing that way, and that's what's happening. So, uh, so kind of nose, nose going that way. So if you, and we give all the vowels names. Now you can demonstrate this by, if you look at those, those two up there, you've got the fleece vowel and the goose vowel. If you say, say the fleece vowel, E, as you say it, just say E, like that, E, E, like a long one, like that, E, right? Okay, think where you think, just imagine, think about where your everything is, your tongue, uh, uh, and how your mouth positioned. Change that to U, go from E to U, go E, U, 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 all right? What's happening is your tongue is moving back. Your lips are changing, your lips are becoming rounded and, and kind of pouting, but also your tongue is moving back. So what we can say is that fleece, E, is a high front vowel because your tongue is high up in your mouth and it's towards the front of your mouth. And the U, the goose vowel, is a high back vowel. It's still high, but it's, it's the, the, uh, your tongue is back in your mouth. You compare that to a, a vowel sound trap in A, go from E to A, you go E, A, your mouth opens because your tongue has to lower to create the A sound, so we can see that in that diagram, trap, A, is a low front vowel, you see, so that's, that's how we kind of position vowels, and all these other ones are somewhere in the middle. Um, incidentally, this is based on a particular accent itself, this diagram, because if you look at the, uh, the bath vowel, of course, with bath and start being in the same place, my accent, I'm from Hertfordshire, a lot of you would have similar accents, bath and start, be the same vowel sound. But if you're from the Midlands, anywhere from the Midlands up, of course, bath becomes like the trap vowel. So this diagram would have to have bath over by trap, okay? So this is, this is a, a difference in, in English pronunciations. We talk about the, the bath trap, <coughs> trap split. That in the south of the country, they're two separate vowels, bath and trap. In the north of the country, they're the same vowel, bath and trap. Same for strut. So strut, for me, is down there. But further north, it becomes closer to foot. Think of it like bus, bus, kind of vowel, all right? So this is, this is how we, we uh, this is the, so these are the positions of the vowels. The other thing we need to, you need to know this a little bit to understand what I'm going to say in a minute. Uh, then we talk about vowels can be different in length. We have the short vowels like kit, so i, u, e, a, o, and whatever. And some vowels are long vowels like e and u and er and o and r. Okay? So this is how we start to differentiate things. The only other ones you need to know are two uh, what are called diphthongs. So all of those other vowels are called monothongs. They're just singles, flat, one, short, not short, but they, they don't change. They're, they're consistent. Diphthongs. They change. They're two vowels pushed together. So we've got price, I, which is like starts with an A and ends in an E, I. And then uh, we've got mouth, which is A to U, so mau, ow. Okay? So it's two, so they're called diphthongs. All right? It's, this becomes relevant in a minute, I promise. <laughs> so there you go. That, I mean, that is a bit of articulatory phonetics, it's called, because it's the, the branch of phonetics, the system of the scientific study of sounds, which deals with how sounds are articulated, how they're actually produced. So a bit of articulatory phonetics. Right. Now, the reason all this is interesting is that the way we, the way we speak and the, way we, uh, the, the accent we have has, plays a very important role in the performance of identities. So this is this idea, and I, if you were here last year, the, this is in, if you remember that, but this is, I spoke about this in terms of performing identities through accents. So the way the archers uses... Uh, uses speech in order to perform particular a, a rural identity or an upper class identity, all of these di you know, different things. And I also said about how we, we understand this as listeners, it's a shortcut. These kind of stereotypes are a shortcut to understanding a character, which we, we can do in TV, you just show the character. You want to show them to be posh or a baddie or whatever, you can create that visually. Radio drama, you have to rely on the voice, so we use the accents a lot to, just, to, uh, to show different characteristics. Um, and so, for example, you could get you know, a working class uh, rural accent. All right? Now, I want to look at the Grundys because the Grundys, if we were doing a proper sociolinguistic study, which is what this is, sociolinguistics, the interaction between language and society, you'd look for a family like this in 
uh, to start to look at how language changes over time. Because your ideal situation is when you have a family who stayed in the same place over generations. And the idea is that, so in this situation, if you, if you look at the difference between the way Joe speaks to the way Will and Ed speak, or then even better, lower down, like George and Jake. And I know Jake isn't, but he, for our purposes, he is, because accents are purely social. There's nothing genetic about accents. Um, so if you, if you look at the difference between those generations, you get an idea of how language has changed, how language has changed over time, because your, lang your accent stays pretty consistent. Once you've, once you've kind of gone past puberty, your accent stays pretty consistent for the rest of your life. So if you measure, measure this accent, this generation against this generation, that's how language has changed in that, in that situation. So the Grundis offer, uh, and that's why I went for the males as well, because it's more consistent. We, we have that pattern. That's the only reason I went for them. So if we look at that, the difference between these, um, we get an idea of how, how, things are, how things are going. I'm looking at five vowel sounds in particular, which is why I explained those vowel sounds before. Okay? So we're looking at the trap vowel, a. Because the reason, looking at this one, is there are two, there's, there are, each of these vowels I'm going to mention, there's kind of a standard variant and a, and a Grundy variant. <laughs> All right? And we're kind of interested in who is, basically we're interested in who is most Grundy and, and, and why. So we're looking at the trap vowel, the bath vowel, uh, uh, the lot vowel, the mouth vowel, and the price vowel. And, uh, and I'll give you give an example of, the, of why we're looking at these features. So this is the trap vowel. So the reason we're looking at the trap vowel is that the Grundy version is a long vowel. Remember, trap is supposed to be a short vowel, ah. But the Grundy-fired version makes it into a, into a long vowel. Uh, so it sounds something like this. Ooh, what does it? Well, everyone's been fantastic these past few weeks. Let me just learn that again. Well, everyone's been fantastic these past few weeks. Just that fantastic, that, that lengthening tone. Remember, we're talking about very small differences. You know, like I say, even between big differences between accents, between accents from, York, from kind of Newcastle to London, it's only actually quite small changes. So that's quite a significant thing. There's two things going on there. There's the lengthening. There's also the fact that pa past is actually the bath vowel, which is becoming like the trap vowel, the northern version. Okay? So that's one uh, variant we're looking at. Uh, the other one is the, um, that bath vowel. So whether bath is pronounced bath, how I say it, or bath. And this is Eddie this time. And he sounds like this. Sort through them glasses. All right, so he's got the short... Sort through them glasses. That glasses. So he's got the northern or Midlands and north version of the, of the bath vowel. Uh, the next one we're looking at is the lot vowel. And with the lot vowel, o, oh, this is... The, the Grundy version, or the, the, the variant I'm looking at, is, is longer, and it's more open. And, and I'll, I'll play what I, how it sounds like. I could easily pick something up from the shop. I could easily pick something up from the shop. Sharp. It's that R. Uh, it sounds R. Uh, it's more like R, uh, like bath, OK? So when I said lower, more open, it's lower in the... If you think of that diagram, and we had off was actually kind of halfway up at the back, and R is lower at the back, so it's more open and it's longer. It should be a short vowel, R, but it's R. Okay, that's Will again. And the mouth uh, diphthong sounds a bit more like the goat diphthong. So instead of being ow, it sounds like this. This is Joe. And then, don't know, makes it work. Not let some lame horse fetch his night out, eh? <laughs> that O, that Oh, a bit more like goat. Okay, that's a particularly... Uh, he was talking about Alistair there, about Alistair not having any friends. <laughs> and... And the last one is, uh, is this, this uh, price. The price diphthong sounds a bit more like uh, a choice. And this might be a real, sound like a real stereotypical um, kind of rural feature. Never mind him. Never moiding. Moind, that moind. So, so, okay, so, so what we've got are these, these, so what I'm saying is for each of these features, for each of these five vowels, there's a standard form and there's a Grundy form. And this is basically what we do. This is what I spend my life doing, is listening to, not for the archers all the time. <laughs> but I wish, but I can't. Anyway, but this is, uh, you know, we're just counting stuff. We just spend a lot of time listening to, to sounds and saying, is it this or is it this? And we count it and we do a lot of, uh, you know, we do a lot of statistics. This isn't quite as sophisticated, I must admit. When I say I spend all my life doing this, uh, all my time doing this, I, I do it in a slightly more sophisticated way than I'm just about to show you. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is, this is a sort of a, 
all this is, this little table just says, so for example, if it's got a tick, it means they do this all the time. Uh, well, I say all the time. This is from the kind of sample. I, 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 I listen all the time, and uh, I kind of collected some to analyse properly, some fairly recent episodes. It, it's quite interesting to see what, actually when the Grundys come in, because they had a, obviously a big... I got most of this actually from when Nick died, because there was a lot of Grundy action. Um, so, I, so what it says is that under that column for the trap valve, you've got, if it's a tick, they use it all the time the Grundy version all the time. If it's a cross, they never use the Grundy version. If it's a tick and a cross, it's mixed. Because most of us, we do kind of mix things. So from that, you can see that the least Grundy accent is Jake. Now, again, I know Jake isn't a Grundy officially, but he actually moved in. They, he was very young, he was quite young. Him and Mia were, were young when they moved in. And I know he's gone back now to, to his dad, uh, but he was, you know, he was still part of that, that family. Um, so the least Grundy person is, is Jake, or the next least Grundy person is Ed, and the most Grundy person is Will. All right? Now, that's, that's a little bit odd. We, we wouldn't maybe expect that in, if we were looking at this, this properly. But there is another Grundy who is more Grundy than all of them. But unfortunately, she's not a, she's not a, a male, so it doesn't fit into this nice pattern. But it is um, Mia. Mia's very Grundy, OK? Uh, she, uh, she, she has all of these things, so she has what Will, she, Will has, but also that one that Will doesn't have, that mouth, uh, the, uh, Val, uh, she has that as well. And I'll just give you a little example of what... Uh, and she has, not only does she has to have them, she has them quite extreme ways. It's full of chat. It's full of chat. OK, you could also do a dialect study with her as well, that I'll kind of him, you know using hymns there. So she's got that long trap vowel, and she's also... No time for boys, all right? Okay, so I, that, that real kind of diphthong there. So that's the... Uh, so she's got the, that trap one, very long trap one, and the price, very much, a, 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 you know, the, the Grundy version of price. So the question is, why, why, this, why this pattern? And again, I, I, so I'm not... This isn't a, a dig the artist at all. It's this idea that this, this is what's being presented. This is, this is the finished product, and that's what we're working with. And whatever accents have come about, that's what's been decided is, is, is for us, and that's what we're listening to. So it's looking at study of that. So why this pattern? The, the strength of the Grundy accent, what we'd expect, what it should be, is it should be that Joe is the strongest, and it would reduce. This is what's happening with certainly with dialects across the country. Accents are still strong, but there should be some change, and you would expect some difference uh, between generations. We know that we don't speak in the same way as our parents or our grandparents, or you know that your children or your grandchildren speak differently from you, and even if you're from the same area, the accent is changing. That's what we'd expect, but in reality, we've got Mia with the strongest accent, and then Will, and then Joe and Eddie, and then Ed, and then Jake. So, why, how can this be? I think... In terms of Will and uh, Ed, I think we could, we could interpret that with the idea that perhaps Will is, is more settled and stable and has had a more narrow life experience. If you think back to their history, the accent we acquire, we, 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 we acquire the accent that's around us when we're growing up. But of course, we, the, the experiences we have and the people we hang around with all have an influence and Ed, we know, has had a much more varied upbringing, a much more varied kind of t teenage time, anyway, and since then. Also, I would say Will isn't trying to, isn't trying to better himself uh, uh, so much as... I'm not saying Ed is, but I think Emma might be. And so, uh, so I think there's maybe that influence. You could imagine that, that, that Ed gets picked up on for certain things he says by, by Emma, perhaps. So there might, uh, there might be something going on there. In terms of Will... And uh, Will versus Eddie, why is Will strong? This is the weird one. Why is Will stronger than Eddie? I think it's the difference between Will and Ed isn't... OK, brothers, that's fine. You can, you know, you can imagine you've also got siblings. I've heard it before, that, that you speak differently. Again, different groups of friends, whatever. But it's a bit odd that Will, and, uh, Will should be stronger than his dad and stronger than his granddad. And I think this might have something to do with Will's role uh, in Ambridge, in the society. I think Will... You think of compared to a lot of the characters, he knows his place and he's quite happy with his place. He has this real; he's involved in a real hierarchy with with, with what used to be Brian, but not not anymore. But there was that kind of Brian, 
and then gamekeeper. And, and he knew that and he liked it and he was proud of it and he didn't want anything more. And I think he does have that sense of, uh, he does have that sense of place more than perhaps Eddie and, uh, and Joe. So I think that might be something to do with it. Um, and also, I think the big thing with, with Will, of course, with Ed, no, with Will, it is part of his identity. It really is. That is part of his gamekeeper, country, rural identity. That's what we're hearing through the use of that accent. As for Mia, why is Mia strong where Jake has literally no Grundy features and Mia is super, super Grundy? I think... I think now we know that Mia, again, Mia is making this choice. She's now part of this, this society. She's being part of Ambridge and Will's life. Jake isn't. Jake is gone now. Jake's removed himself back to Andrew, is it? Back to Andrew. But Mia is, is settling into this place. Mia is also very close to Clara and Emma, who, to be fair, have the strongest Grundy accent. Clary is the most Grundy uh, accent-wise out of all of them. Most consistent as well. She's, she really is. So maybe some, something to do with that. I also wonder with, with Mia... I wonder if this, stepping out a minute from reality for a minute, I wonder if this is, or stepping out from reality, no, st in, anyway, <laughs> whatever, stepping, stepping into that other, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if, I wonder if Mia, I wonder if this is a genuine production decision. Now, I had a brief, okay, I had a brief uh, chat with, all right, okay, all right, so I had a brief chat with a guy called Barry Farrimond. Yeah. Who is an actor who knows Ed quite well? Should we, uh, should we say that? Anyway, uh, I, and I asked him about his, and he, he was saying that they, he, he, he said, we didn't get, get any, any instruction, really. It just happened. It, he was trying to, he said, when I started, whatever, how many years ago, he just said, we were just, there was never really any instruction. I wonder if that's changing now. I haven't found this out for sure, but I wonder if things are getting, people, maybe the you know, listeners are getting a bit more critical, a bit more aware. I wonder if that's a real decision that they've instructed this actress to sound more like this. I, I, I think it might be. Anyway, just very quickly, why does, why, why? does this, any, I don't know, does it matter? Uh, why does it matter? Why, it, it matters because I think the whole point about acts, using accents in drama, it only works, all of these things only work if they resonate with, resonate with, with real life experiences or with experiences outside of, of Ambridge, let's say. And so I think by using that, by looking at that, it gives us insights into how, and into how society works, which to me is the purpose of the whole, this whole event and which some of the things today have been just exceptional in that regard. It's just people using their expertise in one field to let us, you know, view society through the lens of Ambridge, which I guess is the, through the lens of Art the Archers, which is what we're all trying to do. So I think by studying accents in this way, it gives us real insights into society in general. Um, I think uh, on a negative side of things, they, they, the problem is they reinforce these stereotypes, and some of these stereotypes are damaging. That's what I touched upon a bit last year, this idea that there are a lot of stereotypes involved with accents. There's no, there's no, there's no linguistically hierarchy, there's no linguistically um, uh, justified hierarchy of accents. No one accent is better than another. It's all social baggage. It's all socially acquired stuff where we put some accents seen as prestigious and other accents are seen in a negative way. So it reinforces those. So that's maybe not so good. And also importantly, uh, the last point, it does, it reminds us of the link between accent and identity. And this, this link is very strong and it's important to remember that Criticism of language, like I said at the very beginning with regard to Ruth, criticism of, of language is always, always about more than language. Criticism of language is always just a proxy for some other kind of criticism, be that a class-based thing, being a snobbery-based thing, being a, I'm cleverer than you, all of those things. So I think we have to be very careful. But it does, looking at accents like this in, in Ambridge, in the Archers, does kind of give us some insights into that and, uh, and gives us a bit of ammunition to, to maybe challenge some of those prejudices. And there we go. It's always the worst, because you're really conscious of how you start to... Yeah. Right, any questions, anybody? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I just wanted to say about Alice and 
her voice, because what's interesting is that her voice is getting more creaky. And there have been studies which suggest that um, younger women, either consciously or subconsciously, use creaky voice to try to sound more masculine, to be taken more seriously. And her voice seems to be getting creakier as she seems to be coming under more pressure to start having a family and more pressure at work to try to be successful Literally. in her work. Mm. And her voice is getting creakier and creakier, so I think that's interesting. It, it could well be. And also, that when I say everyone uses it, of course... It's it, part of the reason it's noticed more in female voices because it is it's a lowering of pitch, an extreme lowering pitch. But of course, men's voices generally are already lower. So yeah, it, it does stand out more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very good. Did um, <laughs> Joe ever speak different to that? <laughs> Decades past. Do, do you know I, I don't know and I'm really intrigued to some of the you know we all know about actually from like say from Will Barris a few years ago we know mm. from from Pat how Pat went mm, from being Welsh. so Welsh mm. uh, to not Welsh at all mm. and Shula he, he was looking at Shula as well how Shula's uh, voice changed. I don't know I don't know about I don't know whether whether they were, were at all I also heard um Jill, when uh, Jill went on on radio on Women's Hour, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. and they played a clip from yeah. her. It's incredible so how RP. how they change. But I don't know about Joe actually. My memory of Joe Gumbel's voice has hardly changed. Really, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Listen to for me growing up on Exmoor. We loved Joe because he sounded the most Somerset. Mm -hmm. So anecdotally, I think he must have been consistent. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think I, I think he probably was. To be fair. <laughs> I mean, that. I'm asking you as a linguist which silent characters you'd most be interested in hearing voices. Ha ha! Sabrina. Oh, wow! This one over there. Um, uh, whenever I go visiting around the country from London, I always bump into groups, very specific groups of people that all share the same accents. And um, but this is not the case in certainly not Ambridge and certainly not in Borsetshire. Should we all have had a mass hallucination in which none of us had ever been to that locale in our real life? Um, what do you think an actual Borsetshire strong Ambridge accent would sound like rather than the variety that we, we get during our visits? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think last time I spoke about how the rural accent wasn't quite accurate, um, and I, I think it, you, we just have to presume it would be, you know, knowing roughly where it is, I think it has to be something around that kind of, uh, you know, Gloucestershire, Warwickshire, uh, where, where are we? Worcester, Worcestershire, sorry. That kind of accent. So, yeah, I don't know. I think there are features of it. I don't think anyone, I don't think, if, if, it, if, if Worcestershire were where we think it is, I don't think anyone, anyone's consistent, consistently kind of nailed it. I just wonder if not much thought was given to it at the beginning and, and they can't really, you can't suddenly change everything. No. And I, so I don't really know what's happening. But I think with the, with the younger characters sounding similar, I mean, that's, that's a, a pretty consistent with what's going on elsewhere, I think. Um, I'm trying desperately to remember what Nick Grundy's accent was from. Oh, was... Because I would have thought that Mia's accent would be quite like her mom's as the person that she really identified with. Yeah. Um, particularly as since Nick died, Mia's been sort of taking on the mothering role in looking after Poppy and, and, and so on. Yeah, that's um, a... So yeah. would that explain maybe why her accent might be different from her brother's? Uh, to an extent, I think the problem with that is the fact that, and I, I'm, I think now, I can't quite remember. It's only been just over a year ago, and I can't quite remember. And, and, I, and so, but I think, with, in that interpretation, I think, no, I think it's much more likely she'll be, it's hard to be influenced by something, even, even a mother. I think the, I think the influence of, of Clary and, uh, and, and Emma, I, I think Clary in particular, I think that's what's going on there. In a, in a sense, I, you, could, you can read, always read too much into this, but I would say it's, 
that kind of taking on that mother, mothering, kind of nurturing role, and she's seeing Clary as this, this role model. And Emma, and to be fair, that relationship between Emma and Mia, and that lovely, we were talking about it before, that lovely conversation they had, uh, you know, a while ago. And so I think there's something really nice there. I'm sorry, Rob, you're absolutely wrong. There's absolutely nothing that can be taken too seriously about but, this. Uh, <laughs> this is very, very serious. Very, 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 very serious. This whole thing is based on people <laughs> like, reading too much into it. <laughs> reading, okay. if, if you can't read things into <laughs> no, it, sure. then what are we all doing here? Sure. Right. Um, I may be misremembering this, but wasn't there a naughty Grundy who lived... Alfie. 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 Yeah, he came up fairly Naughty. recently, didn't he? He was accused can't. of stealing the money from That's the... That's it. I can't remember. I can't... Yeah he, w yeah, he was... Yeah. Yeah, and I, c I, can't, I can't quite remember how, yeah, how it sounded, but yeah. There was. Of course. Cool. Does some person that she met that you, the actor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that you, what was normal was like? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So I, then I went online. Well, no, so I met him. This is we the kind of messages uh, over over social media. But then I I found a video of him. Do you know what? Do, the reason I came across him, but I just tell you, if you don't know, Barry Faramond, friend Amazing. of Ed Grundy. Amazing. He invented a knot. Yeah. And I had no idea. Is this common oh, knowledge? No, that's not what he got his MBE for, though. No, he's not. The... <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't get an MBE for inventing knots. But he did invent a knot. So. Uh, I found out this out that he, he is if you look on Wikipedia there's a there's a, a knot called the Faramond hitch or something and he invented a knot anyway he also does some really good stuff for sound uh, music yeah. for yeah. Uh, uh, and um, anyway I saw him interviewed and you can just you can tell it's just a, it's a slightly toned down uh, Ed this is what we missed last evening because Carol Boyd, who oh, apparently yeah, yeah. knows uh, Linda Snell quite well, yeah. wasn't it mad the way that she kind of flirted with us? Like she led us towards being Linda and then she would like go kind of, and then she would kind of go, and we were all a bit like, just do the sniff. Yeah. No, I, I think, and I, I read, I read a, an interview with her saying how she was going to 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 do it, and there was a conscious decision. I think she went because isn't she the original, she old old? Yeah. So I think she tried to sort of go back to mm. what she was, and then not be too influenced by it. I think I think her argument was it's important to do it your own way rather than try and recreate another actor's uh, accent, you know. But I, what we were speaking to somebody earlier about how, how fascinating it is that we so quickly forget. Yes. I can't now, I can't hear previous Clary, even though when this Clary came in, to me, this is because I, you know, I only knew the other one. When this one came in, it sounded, it just sounded Jory. quite wrong. Yeah. But now, it's totally natural. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, I think we've got to go. Should we go to... Tea, tea and coffee. Oh, right, right. Thank you very much, Rob Class. Right, everybody, so a uh, half an hour tea, coffee break. See you back here soon. What time? It doesn't really matter. How long have you finished by seven? We're just coming, <laughs> They're just coming back for prizes.